God's grace, his mercy, his peace are yours through our Lord and our Savior who is determined to deliver you. Amen. The gospel speaks about the determination of Jesus that nothing would deter him, not even death threats. And I wonder for, for you, for myself, what is it that kicks in your determination? Isn't it usually having a valuable goal that you're striving toward and then your determination kicks in to get there? And let, Let's just take an example. Let's say a New Year's resolution. In, in January you say, okay, finally I am tired of looking in the mirror and seeing what I look like, so I'm going to take on that weight loss and I have a clear path ahead. The doctor said this would be good for your blood pressure. Everything's going to fit you better. This is my clear goal and you go towards it and after Christmas vacation is done, so you get off that crazy schedule of freedom, and off the cook cookies are all gone, you don't have those temptations in front of you, there you go. And it's going great for the first week, and the second week, and you're, you're seeing this is great, I'm on a new path, I can do this, and then that Thursday, three weeks later, stressful day at work, and you had to miss supper, you come home, and you pig out on chips, and you follow it up with ice cream, because it just tastes good, and the next day you feel bad because you ate all that, you didn't sleep well, you don't get up early to work out, and next thing you know, those deep ruts, those patterns that just haunt you, you find yourself back in the rut, you get distracted, your mind is not on the goal, and your determination wanes, and you justify, you make excuses, and you become happy with just the way you are. It's just the way I am, right? See how quickly our determination wanes, how things can stress us, and then all of a sudden our mind is off the goal. Jesus comes with one goal in mind. He comes with the will of his Father on his mind, and this is what he must do. He must achieve the goal of being the world's Savior. And he was single-focused. And we see now in the Lenten season, as Jesus right away is tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he's, he's hungry, he, he's, he would be completely stressed if you think about 40 days. And the devil comes after him, and now we see all the enemies of Jesus during his whole ministry speaking and acting, trying to get his mind off the goal. Get him to become depressed about how many are believing, how many are following, and, and yet Jesus, we see the single-mindedness and determination he has to deliver. To deliver the world, to deliver you. And so we pick up a few days before he heads to Jerusalem to his final days there, and he is preaching and teaching and healing and in villages and little cities around. And this is what he runs into. Some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. Do you know why the Pharisees wanted to leave that place? Some say they were just jealous because Jesus was getting more popularity. When you heal people and you feed them, you tend to be more popular than the other people that say messages that didn't really resonate with the people. Ah, uh, Maybe. This death threat that they give to him, is it true or not that Herod was searching out to get rid of this one? We don't know. Were they really trying to save Jesus? Don't go there because Herod has it out for you. They wanted him to get into his ministry? I'm not sure. But what I do know is that it wasn't maybe that, that he, they were jealous or, or these outward things. I think the reason why they were so pointed at Jesus trying to derail him is because Jesus got after their heart. No, no one likes to be called on the carpet. I look what happened to Jeremiah. When, when he spoke the truth and they had to look in the mirror, they didn't like to hear what Jeremiah had to say because it was true. And they wanted Jeremiah dead, his voice to be silenced. This can't be true because these other people are speaking a different way and they call themselves from the Lord, but they were false prophets. But this is because the Pharisees had heard messages like this from Jesus because of their hypocrisy. Jesus wanted to get outside, get beyond that veneer of doing everything right to the heart of the matter. And this is what he says. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding of blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape becoming condemned to hell? Therefore I am sending you prophets and wise men and teachers. Some of them you will kill and crucify, others you will flog in your synagogues. And so upon you will come all the prophets' blood that has been shed on earth. Wow. Just because you were born into that family, right? But they were 
continuing on in the same path that their forefathers had. Now, maybe they weren't killing people like the threat in, Jesus, in Jeremiah's day, but the same venomous threats came because he was calling out their hearts. And now they say this about Herod, that he's trying to kill Jesus. And, and some say maybe Herod was because uh, Herod had been confronted by John the Baptist, and he didn't like that at all. Called out on his way he was living with his, his sister-in-law, and, and he said it's sinful. And it cost John the Baptist his head. And maybe, maybe Jesus continuing that ministry was a walking conscience now too for Herod. We're not sure if really there was a debt threat towards Jesus. But this is what Jesus faced throughout his whole ministry. Just like the prophets of old, people coming to tie, try and distract and derail, to get him emotionally involved in things of this world, to make him look like there is no hope, that you're not succeeding. But Jesus came resolute and determined to save. He had his mind in the goal, and nothing was going to get in his way. And even if death threats would come, and death threats would come, just like Jeremiah of old, these are predicted. This is the way it has always been when the truth is resonating in the world. No one likes to hear the heart of the matter. But it's interesting, as Jesus approaches his end, he offers these words. These words towards Jerusalem. He knows what's going to happen as he goes there, and he speaks, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. Jesus longs for Jerusalem. Even though he knows exactly what's going to happen in Jerusalem. Doesn't that seem counterintuitive? How you would long to save and serve the very people that even trot their kids for generations and it would show itself too as he walked in on Palm Sunday that these kids and their parents would boo Jesus that they would be ones that would say, crucify him. That they'd want this one who spoke the truth dead. How could you long for someone, for people like that? And this longing was long-suffering too. This wasn't a quick fix, like a craving, like, like when you need something immediately, so you go through the McDonald's drive through and then, it's, then you're satisfied. The way it's described here is he has been longing for Jerusalem to the point where he is emotionally drained towards this being the goal. I'm going to do this. I'm going to follow through. And, and the problem is, even though he longed for them, this is the reaction he got. You were not willing. You see, all God wanted to do is to gather them together and protect them like a hen gathers its chicks. And it's not doing it to take away their individuality. He's not doing it to get in the way of what they think is right. What does a hen do? It's using itself to protect them from any enemies, to gather these chicks close to protect them with their own life. That's why a hen gathers the chicks, but they were not willing. They wanted their own things, their own way, their own life. They wanted to seek their own peace in an own worldly way. They did not want to be held to account. They were not willing. Those are the real enemies of God. Do you, do you know anyone like that? That is simply heels dug in, unwilling. I think often we think of the enemies of God being those that are against Christianity, those that are like terrorists and, and those that try to legislate against it, that are polemic against anyone that speaks of anything of the Bible and God. Those are the real enemies, but really enemies of God come from those whose hearts are against God. They're simply not willing to be gathered in. So we get to the heart of the matter. And I, I wonder as I look at myself, and, and maybe you can look at you, could Jesus offer similar words to us here today to say, O oh, Lake Mills and surrounding community, I know you're not out to kill God and the prophets. That's, that's not why you're here. But I long to gather you together to me to bring you closer, to mature you to grow you up, to get you focused even clearer on the goal so that nothing gets in the way. I want you to be spiritually and emotionally invested in this, but you're not willing. I try week after week, time after time. I give you all the tools. I give you the power of the Holy Spirit, but you so often find your own way. 
you, you go there and you're great for a day or two, but then you go back into the same ruts. You do the same things again and again. I call upon you and give you every example to trust in me with your whole heart, but you think that you have to do it and it has to be your way. Your confidence comes in the things that you have, but these things are not worth the investment. They're not lasting. I inspired you to forgive as I forgive you completely, yet you hold grudges. You can't do this. Instead, I give you love and consistency and promise and purpose. But that love is not shown. It is not seen. How I long to gather you in, but you are not willing. And then your house remains desolate. These are the sins that come to our heart too. Though they may not be as crass and open as the ones that, that are seen here by those that want to kill the prophets, they're sins nonetheless that get in the way in our relationship to God. Thank God we have Jesus this Lenten season walking the path we can't and don't. Now, I, I have to share with you an experience I had because I think if anything distills what's worth, uh, what, what the value of something is, it would be when you're given a death threat. I was mugged way back when I was at the seminary in, in Milwaukee, and, and a few others were with me too, and it was a, a tire iron, and, and it was a gun, and they wanted all the stuff that we had, you know, just our, you know, wanted to, whatever's worth value. And so I think between all of us, it was about $15, a couple old wallets, and, and maybe an ID for school, and, and a, a credit card that had about a $500 limit on it. it. Go ahead and take that. My life is worth way more than these things that can be easily replaced. But what if those same individuals busted into my house now and were going to take the life of my wife and my kids? Would I say, ah, go ahead, it's not worth it. It's not worth the... Go ahead and take them, right? It changes completely, right? When then it's worth dying for. When, when your wife and children are on the line and they want to take their lives and take them away, then whatever it takes, your determination kicks in and you do whatever it takes to save them. That's the determination of Jesus. Because he sees the value in the world. He sees the value in you and he is determined to deliver. That's why he goes headlong into this. He is determined to save the world who so often would not even come to him and be gathered in. And so when he's given death threats by the Pharisees that say, Herod is out to kill you, look at how quickly he responds. In one breath he says, Go tell that fox, I will drive out demons and heal people today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I will reach my goal. He just repels that threat altogether. He says, I will, I will. I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and I will follow through, and nothing is going to get in the way. You tell that fox, that, that guy who is sly in politics, that he is not getting in my way. And I know that I could be floating in the Jordan River with his command like that tomorrow, but I have a job to do, and I will do it. I'll spend two more days here and then continue on to Jerusalem, and I will follow through because I am the Lion of Judah, far more powerful than any sly fox. And Jesus did just that. He came to follow through, and days passed, and on to Jerusalem, and then the lion became a lamb. Then he decided not to exercise his power and to show his might, but instead stood silent when accusations came that were not deserved. When they couldn't find a single thing wrong with him because he had lived a perfect life, they killed him. But he came to die to take on your death. He came to take on sin so that you could be forgiven. He came to take on your worst fears and get you through. He came to give peace and calm to you because this world comes at us and wants to take us off the path and the goal that leads to him. This is what Jesus determined to do, and thank God he did. He said, not my will, but your will be done. And he lived with that goal in mind and determined to save, and he accomplished it. And Jesus speaks about this determination too. It's interesting because he have the people trying to derail him. If Herod truly wanted Jesus dead, do you know that Herod's death threat was to a man that was really a dead man already, right? That's what he came to do. And the threats of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, so what, Jesus was going to actually die to cleanse the very sins that accused him of blasphemy? 
And those people that were healed, Jesus came to show them, yeah, he has power to heal, but that was only temporary. And it was to give them the ability to see that this is the true one and the real healing lasts forever is yet to come in the resurrection. And then Jesus continues on and says, I must keep going today and tomorrow and to the next day. Do you hear that determination? No matter what enemies I face. And Jesus can translate that to us today too. Even though he's in heaven, he is determined today, tomorrow, and the next day to save you and make you strong. And he is determined the next day to come to you and, and do the same. And no matter what you do, he is going to come to you and gather you together and forgive you and love you the next day and the next day until the goal is achieved. He has blazed this path towards the goal with determination to deliver. And now I ask you, how does that impact you? To model the same determination of which you are saved to a world that still needs to be saved and God has asked you to accomplish it. No, not to be the Savior, but to be the Savior's voice, to be the Savior's hands, to do the things the Savior did, to love and be concerned with determination towards that goal that God the Father can gather all people in like a hen gathers the chick, following the path of our perfect Savior. We love to cheer for the underdog. Think of how many movies and how many shows follow that theme, right? The underdog facing all these challenges that come. And you wonder as the plot turns whether they will be victorious in the end. And sometimes when you see it, if it's really good script and it's really good acting, you might even get your eyes well up a little bit because you think, after all of that, they've come out on top. Isn't that really what we see in the Lenten season? Jesus came to save. Determination to deliver even though he was God, he did experience temptation and suffering just like we do. He didn't use his power to not experience it. And he did it to save. He could have turned this way or that. He could have given up. He had the right to do that, right? But instead, he was determined to save and deliver you. And now he leaves you here to do his work. And what does that mean? With the same determination, Jesus says, now go and visit your life. What can you do? Well, maybe open up your catechism and revisit your catechism promises. Maybe add a little bit more prayer life to your day during the week. Maybe it means to just find a way to chisel out some time to spend a little bit more time with your Savior, keep you focused on the goal. Maybe it's just to go and look around and say, I haven't seen that person in church a while. Maybe I could give them a call and see how they're doing. Maybe it's just finding a way to give more to charity, give more to church. Maybe it's just readdressing relationships and seeing, can I add eternal value to that? Maybe it's going on a mission trip. Maybe it's just defending your faith. Maybe it's even facing death to, to stand on that truth of Jesus. Whatever it is, Jesus' determination to deliver you is the same determination he puts in your heart that you may be determined, be, be determined to follow that goal, to follow that purpose of Jesus who determined to deliver you. Amen.